go with the Hello Wrap on. Um, I felt closer to a way of life, closer than I've ever felt before. And I wanted a way to live the concepts that I was learning, or just just the, the Shema, you know, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. I wanted to know that and feel that and what that meant. And that's one of the reasons why I came here. And I feel closer to that, but I'm still, I'm just learning. I've been here four days. And yet I want to say after well, being... Well, Welcome to Lubavitch House. I'm Rabbi Moshe Feller, the area director for the Lubavitch movement. And I want to invite you for a look inside Lubavitch House. Lubavitch is a worldwide Jewish educational movement headed by the Lubavitcher rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson in New York, dedicated to bringing Jews closer to their sacred heritage. You might know us from our mitzvah campaigns, the sukkahs that we put out uh, all over the city, our sukkah mobile, the Purim kits that come into your home, the matzah shmur that we distribute, the Shabbos candle kits, and our tefillin booths. Possibly you hear our weekly radio program. Here at Lubavitch House, we conduct weekly Shabbatons, weekend live and learn retreats, where members of all ages from the Jewish community come and spend the Shabbos with us. We also have classes throughout the, the year and counseling. We have a resident rabbi and rebbitzin at Lubavitch House, Rabbi and Mrs. Grossbaum. During the summer for three months and for six weeks in the winter, we conduct an intensive uh, Jewish Educational Institute for Women, the Beis Chana Women's Institute. Uh, the principal is Rabbi Manis Friedman, and the Dean of Women is my wife, Mindy. Now, we're going to take a look into the Beis Chana program here at Lubavitch House, and your host will be the principal, Rabbi Manis Friedman, who is presently in uh, discussion with the young women. That also suggests something. It suggests that the individual, before they get married, who is making whatever strides and whatever progress in their own life as a Jew, comes to a point where he feels now it's necessary, as part of his life as a Jew, to get married, meaning to take on a role within the people, within, within the community, to be a part of this continuous chain. And it's not enough to say, I experienced my own personal liberation or my own personal uh, release from exile, coming out of Egypt in my own personal way, and, and I am now in touch with the truth. So one of the indications as to whether or not the program is a success is how dedicated or how feasible is marriage to you now compared to what it was before. Before I was really out of touch with anything. It's like the thought of being married was so far off, so totally distant. I didn't know how anyone did it. And now I can really see it coming into my life. It, part of it could be because I'm growing up too. But it seems like maybe just four years away as opposed to 20 or 30 years away. And mentally also, I don't know how the difference really came about me. Since I became from, I, I said there's no other way for me than a Hasidish way of life and marriage. And that's the most important thing. Yes. So one of the things that attracted me was that it seemed to me that we were the first one considering getting married. Um, you, the two partners, we, we both have a common goal to which they're going to work. And they'll work, um, they'll work within themselves and they also work with, be able to work with the community to, to bring, to show other people um, a way that can make marriage a success and a way that can um, bring joy into the family and a way in which they can raise their children to, um, to give them a meaning in their lives and to give meaning to every day and every time of the year. There's something lacking there. I want your reaction to what we were talking about the other night, that there has to be this belief in the importance and validity of marriage before you choose whom you're going to marry and stuff like that. What's, what's your reaction to that? I, 
I'd like to say something because, I mean, I was divorced and I got very, well, even before my divorce, there was a time, I mean, America tends to turn you off to marriage because there's a, a whole thing in our society. I'm trying to get a reaction to this question here. Is, is the concept that we talked about the other night, is that an acceptable or understandable thing to you? Yeah. That there has to be this commitment to the institution of marriage based on the fact that it's the lifestyle that God chooses for us or has chosen for us, and that that is probably the crucial foundation upon which a marriage is going to be built. Can you relate to that? Hmm? Yeah. Let me yeah, get your I can relate to, relate to that, because otherwise it would be unnecessary to marry. You know, you could uh, shack up here or shack up there, and if it didn't work out, move on to the next person. And uh, marriage, uh, only s really seems to make sense in a kind of overall social context, you know, in terms of raising children and people staying together for a, a long enough period of time to raise children and to set them into a proper, their proper place in, in the society. G getting back to the other question that you were asking, uh, there are two things that I was thinking about. One is that before I got involved in this, I mean, it was sort of obvious to me that that the the, uh, the Jewish way of life seemed to be dying out. But I would say to myself, well, so what? What difference does it make? I mean, the hot and tot to uh, die out and the, you know, so forth and so on. It's a historical progression and uh, it's unimportant or something like that. And I sort of I think that the reason I had that attitude is that I had no idea what really was involved in a Jewish way of life or what it meant to be a Jew. The discussion is one of the many forms of communication. Uh, we thought that it might be interesting to get some individual reactions to some of the things that we study and discuss here at Beis Chana. We'll be talking to some of the girls individually, starting with Feige Silberman from South Africa. Peggy, what do you think of the discussion we had and the uh, role of marriage in your life? Well, that's the whole thing that um, the marriage life in Judaism appealed to me to become involved. And um, when I saw the families, how together they were and um, how tolerant they were of each other and kind to each other, and the children were always together, it just appealed to me. And I thought I must find out more about it. And what did you find out? Um, well, I found when I came to America that, um, that uh, by having uh, a, the Torah as a guideline, um, you had certain commandments to fulfill, which um, gave you a purpose to your life. And learning Hasidus um, put a lot of warmth into it and love. And with that, the husband and, and the wife seemed to have an understanding of each other and were tolerant of each other. They seem to have guidelines. And um, How long have you been here? I've been here six months. And on the things you learned, how would you sum it all up? The teachings of Hasidus? Um, the teaching of Hasidus gives you an um, understanding of yourself and so you can um, be more understanding of the next person and more tolerant of the next person and it teaches you to love your fellow Jew and um, be responsible for your fellow Jew. When I came here to Minnesota from Philadelphia, the possibility of, of marriage had become a reality to me. I decided that the most important thing in life, a meaningful thing to do, is to get married and have a family. But it was a very frightening thought, the thought of having children and telling them what to do, how to lead a good life. And I felt that I needed something more solid, something very basic, which I could convey to my children in a more meaningful way than what my mother had been able to tell me. I wanted to be able to sit across from my daughter 
and tell her what it was to lead a good life. Also, I, I think of my parents and, and where, they, where they are right now. And the place of old people in the society. And I feel that in Judaism, there's a spot for you when you get old. That one is respected. and honored at, at, uh, at that time. So thinking about what to tell your children or what to be able to say to your daughter across the table, what made you think that Judaism had anything to offer in that area? Well, I think it's the only religion where it's a mitzvah to be nice, <laughs> where kindness is really a value where love is important, but not in a general, hippie, far out sort of way. There's specific ways how to love and what to do. When you're a Jew, when you're an observant Jew, it's a mitzvah to visit the sick. It's not simply a nice thing to do, and if you have time, maybe you'll go to the hospital. If someone's sick, you must go and visit them. And the rewards over and above the smile from the person in the hospital bed. Uh, I would say that I've reordered my priorities, that I've shifted around what I thought was most important to me, and been able to face some things that I that I really truly wanted that I couldn't admit to myself were what I wanted and that I, <clears throat> I believe I'm approaching uh, an idea of how to go about attaining my goals and how to set for myself the, the highest possible goals, uh, a kind of a, a structure that I can live within to move towards a meaningful feeling of, about my life. So uh, what, what will the first thing be that you're going to do when you get back home? <laughs> Um, well, it may sound a little peculiar, but I think the first thing I want to do is get a, a well-paying job. <laughs> In terms of Judaism, how is that going to affect your life? Can you take any job you want, or are you limited in the fields of, of the work that you're going to be able to do? Well, I'm li only limited in the sense that I won't work on Shabbos. But as far as what I would be doing, I think that's within what I've been already doing and want to continue doing, but that my approach to it would be different. What about the traditions of Judaism? Have they entered your life at all? Yes, they, they've definitely entered my life, and I, I feel like they, um, in many different ways, one of them being the Jewish holidays, which, which to me seem much more meaningful and valuable experiences than the traditional American holidays that I've been observing for most of my life. And, um, and I really am looking forward to, to maintaining those holidays. I like them. On a daily basis, has your life changed at all? You mean here and now? Well, I feel, I feel calmer. Yeah. I feel more relaxed. But at the same time, I kind of feel like uh, I'm reaching some important questions that maybe have been buried underneath that I wasn't dealing with so that other things disturbed me and I wasn't recognizing that it was the, the deeper questions that were at the root of it, you know, and that maybe these questions are coming out in the open now and that some of them I've already, uh, I believe, come to a reasonable conclusion on and that others I'm still grappling with, but it's still, it's better than than not recognizing that those were the things that were really bothering me. I came here because since seven years old, I've always wanted to be a social worker. Just recently, I've gotten involved in the studies of Judaism, and I learned that the Jewish community is dying out. And one way that I wanted to revive some of the old traditions and make a contribution of myself and from what I've learned about social work and Judaism is to be a social worker in the Jewish community. 
And one of the ways I wanted to really know what the Shema meant was to come here to the Lubavitch house. I'm very attracted to uh, the philosophy and the people here are wonderful. It's a community where we all share a religious experience. Everyone is accepted for who they are and for who they are not. We are encouraged and challenged on our beliefs. Like if you don't agree with one of the rabbis, you know, you get into a really incredible discussion and you find out so much more of, of who you are, where you're coming from, and, and where you're going, and what your relationship is to yourself and also to other Jews and throughout the history. Um, how, do you see this, how do you see this experience helping you in your social work? Um, I find that I learn more about the people who I'm with, where I'm coming from, how to relate better to people um, who I've never even met before that, are, that have all different backgrounds. And in social work, I'm going to learn and have to do that. My listening skills have improved. Um, I learned to perceive a situation and find out where people are without making judgments, which is one of the hardest things to do. Uh, how does the uh, tradition or the ritual fit in? For the tradition and the ritual for me, I wanted to find a way of life that I could live that which I believe or that which I've read about. And I find that this is the way to do that. And coupled with social work, I can be what I would call living out my religion as well as helping my, myself and helping others to be who they are and happier with themselves and to live a good life. And I think that uh, the family and living a good life is what it's all about. Uh, in your own opinion, what is it about the Lubavitcher movement or the Hasidim that attract the young people? Well, I think uh, that the Lubavitcher Hasidim is, um, if I can define it in this uh, way, it's a, it's, a, it's a revolution, really, because um, it, it, um, it shows it's um, the nice part of the religion. Uh, people from the outside don't know how nice it is. And um, once they come here, they see that uh, uh, there is a whole different atmosphere in here. And um, people are so nice to you. And all of them really feel that they, they, they are related to you. They are a part of you. We feel like one big family in here. The philosophy or the teachings of Hasidus, do uh, you find that it, you have to live in a certain place and have a certain kind of a lifestyle in order to be able to benefit from it? Um, I don't think so because um, I, I think that you can even do it uh, um, on your own without being uh, all together. Like if you live in another place, I think you can do it uh, if, uh, if you want to, definitely. What would you say to people back home when you get back home uh, that uh, that they could appreciate? Well, um, I have so much to say, really, uh, because I, I would say to people to come and try if they can, because um, um, I'm sure that many people have a negative idea. Like, I came from all that way, you know, I, I came from far away, and I came from another country, different culture, and yet, being here with so many different people, I found my way, and uh, I really feel, I really feel different. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's go to a classroom scene and find out what it is that the girls are studying about and learning in the formal study sessions. A mezuzah is a written scroll which is placed on a doorpost, on a doorpost to every entrance to the house, to every room in the house except for bathrooms and closets, small closets. A mezuzah what is known as a mezuzah is something which is written by a scribe in a certain kind of, a special kind of an ink. And it has the two parshas of Shema Yisrael written on it. And if it doesn't have those parshas, and if it's not written by hand, and if it's not on a scroll prepared in the proper way, then it's not a mezuzah. It's just a plain piece of paper. What's that letter sometimes you see on the outside? The letter on the outside indicates the first letter of God's name, Shin, David, and Yud. First letter of God's name, which is placed as a sign that this is the outside of the mezuzah, yes? If you move into a new apartment and uh, you see it's painted over, is that kosher mezuzah? Provided it's not too deep, but you should check it anyway because perhaps with age it's worn away. A mezuzah has to be checked twice in seven years, by the way. And, and just because you put it on doesn't necessarily mean it's kosher, yes? 
Where do you go to check? You have to go to a scribe who is clear in what the mezuzah is supposed to look like in the letters. Remember, the letters of the mezuzah have to be written perfectly. There can't be any letters missing or any letters split or, or any words missing. And if any such thing does happen, then the mezuzah is non-kosher, yes? Can anyone put a mezuzah on their door? Can you just walk? If you want to put a mezuzah up, can you just walk by one? And you have to buy one. one. You have to know how to roll it up. You roll it up from the left side into it toward the right side with, on, on the, uh, with the lettering on top, on the top of the mezuzah. Place it on the right-hand side of your doorpost as you enter, and it should be in the top third of the doorpost, of the doorway. And it should be leaning slightly inward. Can and anybody can do it, yes. Tape it on, or does that It should be nice? put on with something which will last for a long time. Tape is also good, I imagine, but it's better to put it in with nails. Suppose you're only going to be in an apartment for a little while. How, how long is a little while? A year. A year you have to have this is a 30 okay, days. 30 days delineates what is considered a permanent residence. I mean, as far as permanently fixing it. Well, you should, you should put it on if you're going to be there for a year's time. If you're going to be there for 30 days' time, you should put it on. After th I mean, if you're going to be there longer than 30 days, after 30 days, you have to put it on, yes? Does mezuzah have to be a certain size? No. Mezuzah, as long as it's written properly, with the letters written in the proper way, in the proper order, then there's no size to the mezuzah. By the way, there is nothing in the mitzvah which requires that you have to have a case. A case is completely extraneous to the mitzvah. You should wrap it around with something, but what you wrap it around with is completely additional. The most important thing is the mezuzah itself. The casing regardless of whether it's made out of solid gold, is not a mezuzah unless it has the scroll written properly inside. Many people don't know that, and they just buy a casing with even a postage stamp on the inside. Where can you get proper mezuzahs from? You have to go to a scribe or a bookstore, bookstore that sells the mezuzah and have the, the mezuzah checked by another scribe. Yes? Um, you just answered my question. I was going to ask how you know it's How right. do you know how often to, uh, to check The minimum is twice in seven years. So once every three, three and a half years. So who do you have to ask? You have to go to a scribe who is well, who knows the laws of mezuzah and who can correct the mezuzah if it can be corrected. Yeah, yes? Is there any special ritual when you put it on? When you put it on, you say bracha, a blessing, before you fix it. And you're supposed to fix it, by the way, from the top and the bottom. In other words, you're not supposed to let it hang. You have to put it from the top and the bottom and, and attach it there. Yes? What is the bracha? What does it mean? What do I sanctified us and commanded us to set in our doorpost the mezuzah? Why not in the bathroom? The bathroom is not a, a uh, place of honor and therefore need not have a mezuzah. It's only your house which is an honorable place, but that which is not an honorable place is a tannery or a bathhouse also need not have a mezuzah, yes? Why do we have to have mezuzah at all? Well, because the Torah says specifically you shall write them on your doorposts. We're over at the studio now, and before we go on with our program, I'd like to mention that uh, this Sunday we will conclude three months of study of our summer session at Beis Chana, and that our next session will begin during the winter break, which this year starts on December 9th. Uh, for more information and for registration for this program, there's a number you can call at Lubavitch House, 698-3858. Uh, you can call now or sometime during the day tomorrow. I have with me here one of the younger members of our institute. Her name is Rachel Ross, and she's from Carmel, California. We didn't get a chance to talk about the backgrounds of the older girls. We were busy talking about marriage. But we'd like to get a little more information about uh, Rachel and uh, why she's here. Can you give us a little bit about uh, what involvement you had with Judaism before you came here? Well, when we moved to California about four years ago, um, through some friends of my grandfather, we met some people who live in the town where we were moving, and they were Jewish. And they had a friend who knew a little bit about Judaism and wanted to start a class. So we had a class once a week, and we just learned a little bit. And through this woman, um, I felt like I wanted to learn more, and I wanted to learn how to read Hebrew. So I went to um, a religious school at a Reform congregation in the next town to where I live, and I learned how to read Hebrew. And I became very involved in the congregation, and also in several youth movements. And um, 
I felt like it wasn't enough and I was becoming more and more religious. And I had friends in different parts of Northern California who were also in the youth movements who were also becoming religious. And like whenever we'd find out a new law, we'd go and tell it to the other person and sort of pieced everything together. And where would you pick up this little piece of information? Uh, from someone else or maybe if we saw a rabbi somewhere or read a book, whatever. Well, being so involved with Jewish life and even with, with observance, why did you feel that you wanted to come here? Well, I wanted to, I had a summer free. I wanted to come somewhere to study more, to learn more. And I also felt like uh, everything, all just the laws were kind of dry and I wanted to learn the philosophical side to it. I knew there had to be more than just the straight law. And I had a little contact with Lubavitch and I liked what it was doing. So I came here. How old are you, Rahul? Sixteen. And you're in what year of high school? I'm going into twelfth grade. Okay, we've got a lot of teenagers possibly listening to us right now. If there was anything, if you had a moment where you could uh, say something to your fellow teenagers, uh, how, would you, how would you say it? What would you say to them? Well, I think that it's a big advantage for a person to start learning about mitzvahs and Torah when they're very young. And because then when you get to the point in your life when you want to decide, do I want to be religious or not, you know what there is to decide. And if you don't know anything about Judaism, you can't really decide since you have no basis. So if you haven't had this basis before, I think you should start learning right now and uh, study Torah. And uh, I also, I really wish that my little brother would start learning now before he gets any older the way we do here. Talking about starting young, uh, the Lubavitcher movement has been involved in the revival of a custom uh, in which little girls are urged to light Shabbos and Yom Tov candles of their own. I think we have a little piece of our film left in which we see one of the younger girls uh, lighting the candles and the forming this picture. The lighting of the candles welcomes the Sabbath queen. At Lubavitch House, even little girls learn to love the Shabbos by lighting candles.